Isekai trash worth treasuring. The Eminence and Shadow by Mother's Basement. This is like a 27 minute video. This is gonna be an hour long reaction. Let's fucking go. Kill not that within you which is cringe. Kill the part that cringes. Few anime you made that heroes shit up. embody this philosophy. Eh, who am I kidding? Most anime heroes embody that philosophy, but none pull it off with quite as much shameless panache as Sid Kageno. True? <laughs> The fucking poop moment with Skell and Poe. These are actually really funny moments. I actually love Skell and Poe. They're like the perfect side characters who are like actual good friends. Unlike in high school, DxD Isai's friends, trash. Absolute trash. I'll die. By day, he wears the material. Look at their serious faces when he's saying this, bro. Skell and Poe is straight up. They're so, they're so good friends. They're taking this shit seriously. This shit, yes, that's a pun. By day, he wears the meticulously CGI manufactured horse. mask of background character A at the magic sword school he got isekai into attending. But by night, he dons the pitch black cloak that's of the right. eminence in shadow. Darker Mastermind than black. Behind a cadre of anomalously hot spandex-clad fighting ladies hot spandex clad fighting ladies he's not wrong that's exactly what shadow garden is and someone made a good point too someone i'm not i'm, I'm not sure if this is a headcanon or not but like the reason why shadow garden members are all so hot is to make shadow or sid seem more like a background character if he's like surrounded by hot women like that then he'll be less like recognized or something i'm not sure if this is true known as shadow garden and mm -hmm. together, they hunt down members of a demonic conspiracy that's controlled the world from the shadows since the ancient times. Or at least that's what he pretends is going on as he's beaten up random bandits in accordance with his long-held childhood fantasy of leading the mysterious OP third faction of a Power Ranger type deal. What he doesn't realize is that none of his subordinates think they're just playing along with him. To Shadow, this is all roleplay. But to the shades and everyone around them, this is real life. Only Shadow thinks this shit is fake. And I'm not sure how much longer this is gonna... Well, I'm sure the point isn't for him to have a realization that everything was real the entire time, right? Unless this is like end game content where it's like truly at the late game which Eminence and Shadow is about to end. And there's like a revelation of like, oh, by the way, guys, like, uh, by the way, like, like if Shadow realizes that this is real... I don't, is there any point to that? I guess it'd be like a funny moment as like a gag, but I don't think so. And neither does the demonic cult that's controlled the world from the shadows since ancient times. He only thinks he made all that stuff up, but Sid is a man who plays way harder than he works, so that's probably what's best for the... Plays harder than he works. I would kind of... If I didn't watch so much Eminence and Shadow videos recently about his training, his powers, I would agree with this just like blindly, but he actually works so fucking hard. He has the work ethic of like Rock Lee from Naruto. He's mastered so many different martial arts and even that was not enough, so he decided to go beyond and fucking become atomic. No, I think his work ethic actually is insane. The long-term fate of the world, all things considered. And it's certainly what's best for us in the audience since this show's bombastic action scenes go every Yo, this magic here was actually important, right? The way that the water was being used? Every bit as hard as he plays. Shadow isn't quite as absurdly powerful as your son's Goku or Anos's Voldy. One more time? What did you just say? As absurdly powerful as your son's Goku or... Son's Go- Is this a meme? As your son's Goku. He, he, no, this, this, he's playing with the word, it's Son Goku, but he's saying, your son's Goku. Okay, just memeing around. Voldigoed, but what he lacks in stopping power beyond the scale of a conventional nuclear warhead, he more than makes up for with sheer swagger. And I'm not just talking about the incredible animation. Anos may get to say some pretty badass lines like, yes. Did you really think stopping time would stop me? But Did you really think killing me would be enough to kill me or some shit like that? I like of his lines though Anos one one lines like that that like that's like brand right like it's a very recognizable thing that Anos does and it's so ridiculous and people love it to him those are all just statements of fact not carefully rehearsed zingers and by true true Anos is not like practicing these lines 
Shadow is still not caring enough to, for example, name any of his attacks. He kind of auto loses a lot of cool points to even the slow, powerful buildup of a good Kamehameha! But even that's not intentional on Goku's part. It's just a byproduct of the entire Dragon World operating on wrestling logic. Among all the OP protag kuns, only Sid has the genre awareness and dedication to spend the countless hours posing in front of a mirror that it takes to come up with something as transcendentally cool as I am. He said the line! So remember, kids, it's not the size of your power level. It's what you How you do. use it. That's right, it's not the size. Size doesn't matter, guys. It's not about the size of the ship. It's about the movement of the ocean, okay? Though, on that note, Sid Kageno doesn't really need to be able to solo an entire planet because he's got something few other anime protagonists besides Ippokun can claim. A what? canonically massive... Dong. What's more, he's a... Wait, was that, that's not Alexia's look while looking at Shadow's cock, right? Rower, not a shower, so it's a symbolically relevant... Wait, he did mention that, that he's a grower, not a shower, right? He straight up says, oh, you think, like, the, this is my holy Excalibur power level right now? No, 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 and then he slaps that shit. That was one of the best moments, bro. Massive c And it's in such subtle narrative details that the eminence in Shadow, the anime, not the guy, reveals its own staggering hidden power level. The genuine mm -hmm. genius that underpins its absurdly trashy self-indulgent story. Which we'll get into in a moment, but first, let me tell Sponsor you how to shop like you're in another world, or oh. at least another country, specifically Japan, with today's sponsor. Sponsor of the day, Raid Shadow Legends. That's right, hashtag Kaka for your free five-star unit, Raid Shadow Legends, and back to the regular video. Anyway, while it seems at first glance to be tossing ideas about willy-nilly purely for the sake of humor and fan service, Eminence in Shadow is one of those rare, optimally efficient anime that truly uses every part of the narrative buffalo. Hmm? Really included. Hell, it even finds a narrative purpose for the rapper a Oh, optimizing for narrative purposes, using different items, such as even the fucking burger wrapper. This has so much meaning, this is so much like nostalgia that Oriana fucking keeps on to it till the very end of season one finale and when the burger wrapper is ripped up by the drill sergeant we as the audience actually feel pain because it's not just a regular burger wrapper there is meaning towards it Sid gave her this burger wrapper during their last encounter before he said basically hey Go fucking do whatever you want at the Rose Kingdom right but still it meant a lot to her Round all that ground bison meat actually Sorry, it's probably cow or some fantasy equivalent. In they really love this burgers, man. Waifus and burgers. Actually, that's like a funny... I think like anime girls and like McDonald's hats or like eating burgers. There's something cute about that. Those burgers got a little carried away with my own metaphor there. But nonetheless, my point still stands. It's really cool how the increasing prominence of burgers and burger wrappers in the back half of the series, A, provides evidence of the increasing influence of Shadow Garden via their meat. Did Mitsugoshi introduce fast food chains too? Because they did introduce like modern things like makeup, lingerie, business attire. Did, did they just start up McDonald's too? Did I miss this in season one? Holy shit. Mitsugoshi Company Front they did. B highlights wow. how different this world's culture is from our own, with fast food being a high class novelty there, and C. I didn't even pick that up in season one. Fast food was high class novelty. To us, it's just straight up junk food. But like, to them, this is insane, fan like, amazing, delicious food. Wow, this shit. I wonder how much they make people pay for burgers. Like, is it cheap? I mean, McDonald's right now isn't fucking cheap either, bro. Fucking McChicken. Sorry, Junior Chicken back in the day. Like, these items used to be dollar menu items called. They were literally called dollar value or some shit. Dollar deals, right? Because everything was a dollar. Hamburger, a dollar. Junior Chicken, a dollar. And then you know what they did? They fucking rebranded. These greedy corporate fucks decided to rebrand the name from dollar value or something to the value menu. Something like that. So then it's like, oh, we have a, we can actually increase the price of these dollar items to make it like a dollar fifty. And now a junior chicken is fucking going for like three dollars twenty cents or some shit in Canada. What the fuck? He creates a symbolic through line for when Rose is stripped of the last shreds yeah. of her old life. 
her clothes are stripped, right? This whole point is like a drill sergeant stripping a new candidate. You know, like throw away your mortal desires, everything that you were before, and start your new life as Roku Roku Roku. But it's not just her clothes being ripped apart. No, it's the burger wrapper. There's so much symbolic, you know, meaning here. And becomes number 666. Look at her hands shaking. The, story's conclusion. the setting itself is also carefully constructed to be ideally fertile ground for Gamma to introduce the... Fertile ground? Is this... Is, is the ground breedable? <laughs> ...modern innovations that mm. Sid told her about from Japan. You're gonna put the fucking makeup on the ground, but okay. Like chocolate and burgers. From the yeah. gaslit build... The chocolate, too! Sherry Barnett's chocolate! Mitsugoshi products! Damn, I, I just did not pay attention to that kind of stuff in season one. Not, not a single bit, bro. Mitsugoshi was like... I knew that Gamma had a company, and I knew that she was super rich, but I didn't really understand, like, their influence on everything. I just thought they just sold lingerie, but it's like, nah, they got way more. Buildings and streets, which still carry horse-drawn carriages, to the massive steam engines that now connect its various cities, to the primitive guns wheel- This is all Mitsugoshi? These trains, these cars. Buildings and streets, which still- Buildings and streets. It's not just the chocolates and burgers. The build, the infrastructure as well. Mitsugoshi did all this. Harry horse-drawn carriages. These are all CGI too. Every time, bro. To the massive steam engines that now connect its various cities. To the and the guns, the weapons too. guns wielded by bandits and soldiers. This is a world clearly in the throes of a pre-electric industrial revolution. No, 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 no. These are like already pre-existing products. Like this is not Mitsugoshi, right? One where massive societal change comes in a matter of years, not decades. And it's hardly surprising to see the nature of commerce, <laughs> culture, or cuisine shift overnight. That was a On mini an burger. On level too, the blend of early modern industrial elements and scientific knowledge with full-blown magic gives the series a rare and enticing vibe similar to that of Full Metal Alchemist, which is most certainly a great move from a marketing perspective, as everyone loves Full Metal Alchemist. That's another anime that we haven't watched in this channel. If you guys want to watch that shit, fucking mention it, bro. Like, should we watch Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood? Maybe? But what I love most about Eminence's setting is how all those distinct aesthetic elements are themselves incorporated into the narrative and action. I mean, y you can't just put a train in an anime and not have people fight, fight on it. Fight on it, yeah, so yeah. That much was probably... And this shit's gonna happen with John Smith versus Alpha, right? I'm pretty sure in the trailer, like, straight up, they are well. Last episode we fought inside the train, but I'm pretty sure in the trailer we saw John Smith versus Alpha on top of a train, right? A given, but the way the school's gaslight system is used to demolish it in spectacularly pyrotechnic fashion at the end of the second arc was a very satisfying surprise. And I'm still not done praising the setting because that system even works on a symbolic level. I mean, think about it. Could there be a more perfect way to light the setting? of a story where the protagonist is gaslighting literally everyone. Some people said that the world building in Eminence and Shadow is really weak, but I'd really argue against that. I think the the world that we know it is a little limited because like immediately you're just thrown into the Eminence and Shadow, right? Like you, you're just known as this one kingdom in Midgar, right? But then there's like the Rose Kingdom and there's like the Lala City now and they're introducing more and more stuff, even like our hideout, our HQ, right? I forgot the name of it, but I think that the world building is actually good, and I actually do enjoy the setting. They just introduce it piece by piece just a little bit, right? Including himself? I think not. Okay, that English colloquialism did only recently rise to prominence, so it's highly unlikely that Daisuke Aizawa actually intended that connotation in his- Daisuke Aizawa is probably the author of Eminence and Shadow. His original 2018 web novel, but it is exactly the sort of coincidence that Shadow would take full credit for if you pointed it out to him. And also, I lied. That's but insane. When they were fighting, we actually saw Anne Rosa here for a second. I'm pretty sure that's not the only time we see Anne Rosa in the behind the scenes, right? Look. And also... Like, look at this. Beatrix, Iris, and Shadow, they're all fighting. Anne Rose is just here. She's about to leave. And I think she was actually talking about Shadow or, like, mundane man is thinking, like, I wonder if they'll remember me or something. Oh, I lied. The term originated in a popular movie from 1944, so it's totally plausible that the Japanese might already know what gaslighting is. And not... 
I'm sure gaslighting doesn't like gaslighting hasn't existed forever. It's just we have different terminologies for it. At the end of the day, gaslighting is just just making just forcing false things onto someone else, right? You're just saying that you did all this shit even though they didn't do it. I'm sure like it's a different term back then. Not only is it plausible, but here's a Japan Times article proving that they do. Check oh, okay. it, atheists. <laughs> He actually fucking got an article to prove his point that gaslighting existed. All the right, okay. The wisdom of the shadows knows no bounds. On that note, I adore how the series uses mm. four of the original seven shadows to disseminate Sid's wisdom from... Four of the seven? Probably Beta, Alpha, Epsilon, Delta? That's probably the main ones in the, in the focus, right? Because Eta, Zeta, and... And who else? Was, who, am I, who am I forgetting? But I, I think, no, I, I guess those are the main ones in season one. Earth into its broader fantasy setting with Ada rapidly modernizing technology and architecture. Never mind. Gamma selling the results. Never mind. I, okay, I, I thought he was, okay. He's talking about how the shades here, these members are like actually adding to Shadow Garden. Of her R&D along with modern food and consumer goods and her modern department. Gamma again actually fucking goaded. If you, I mean, even combat wise, she took out one of the strongest members of Yotsuba. Sorry, the strongest member, the first leaf, right? He's very strong. And Gamma did the shh 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 and took him out. But besides that, too, like her impact for Shadow Garden throughout the different companies, throughout the fucking massive hold she has in like the, the, the economy here, I think she is like one of the most important people. Department stores, Epsilon proliferating the classical piano piece. She doesn't just play the piano though, right? Because she does spy like espionage stuff. And I'm looking for more moments when Epsilon gets more of a focus. Like, like I want her, I want like a dedicated episode. Actually, they kind of did that, right? When we first got introduced to Epsilon during the, the well, when, when Epsilon actually got to finally talk in like the Holy Kingdom arc, right? When we went to summon Aurora, she was doing espionage work there. And we like met Epsilon in the dark and stuff like that. But I want to see more of Epsilon doing stuff like that. Because so far, we've gotten a lot of scenes with, uh, who was it? Delta? We got a lot of scenes with Gamma recently too. But I'm just waiting for my Epsilon episodes, man. Pieces that are so essential to his eminence's aesthetic and beta ensuring that everyone in the world gets his Dragon Ball and Shakespeare references by plagiarizing. Every book here was a fucking straight up pun. I love how the author does the puns in this show, man. It's not just like the names of the characters too, but these books, everything else is just a pun. ...rising her way into a successful writing career. The concept of striking it rich in an isekai world with knowledge from our real one is a mm. popular non-violent alternative to the action-oriented wish fulfillment we typically see in the genre. But no matter how- Yeah, because like isekai... So there's a lot of hype moments, right? There's a lot of like OP power scaling moments like that. But one of the beautiful things about Isekai is like the difference in like the civilization of where we used to come from versus where we are now. For example, campfire cooking in another world. The really hype moments, the more entertaining moments was when we had like, we, we basically, if you haven't seen the show, it's, a guy, it's about a guy from modern Japan moved to a different like ancient time and their cooking material sucks. So he just brings in like simple spices and herbs from like fucking Amazon because he has like Amazon online for some reason. That's his power. And like he brings in these modern herbs and spices and like sauces and suddenly people are just fucking freaking out and popping out and he's able to do like crazy merchant deals even like bringing products like shampoo like this is if you just like hear what i'm saying right now it's not very exciting but when the people in the show realize how valuable these products are and he just starts referring to the main characters like a god because he has access to something as simple as like salt it's actually very entertaining. It's not isekai. It's not the only. That's not the only way, right? These kind of crazy fights is not the only way to bring entertainment. How OP a pro tag kun gets, it inevitably strains our suspension of disbelief if he or she is too successful in mm. too many areas. It does get boring at times, right? I think that's why it's so important to focus on the, the supporting characters. Again, same example I keep making in these Eminence and Shadow videos is. This is basically Isekai One Punch Man. And if you haven't seen One Punch Man, it's about a guy that just one punches everything. The main character is so strong, he can end every fight in one punch. But the thing is, if you keep doing that, shit gets boring. What are you watching? Where's the fucking hype? That's why the author initially introduces the main character as someone really OP. But then, he's not there all the time. The entire story is then focused around these supporting side characters. And you're so engrossed into their own struggles and limitations and fighting against different opponents who would otherwise be fodder by Shadow or Saitama, 
you are immersed into the su supporting characters and you can feel the threat of these opponents, even though they're not really that strong compared to Shadow, right? And then he comes in at the end to fucking finish it off in a really cool way. That's how you keep repeating and spamming and farming this, this OP Isekai Protect, you know, this formula, right? Especially if he's also out kicking ass and taking names with his super-powered fantasy powers. But if you have half of Protag Kun's harem live mm -hmm. that fantasy for him, then you can just go whole hog on it in any way that you want. And you can even make a very funny joke out of him being jealous of all of their success. But again... <laughs> so he is jealous of their success. So that's why he's like stealing coins. I don't know. I just thought that Shadow's always been like a pickpocketing, just like a greedy fuck. That's why he went to the Lala City to pickpocket. That's why he just steals coins from Gamma instead of asking. But if he truly is jealous of their success, I guess it makes more sense as to why he wants to break down, you know, Mitsugoshi or Shadow Garden in this current John Smith arc to bring it up again. But like, let's get real. Once that happens, once Shadow, once John Smith like destroys Shadow Garden's Mitsugoshi and brings up a new company, do you think that Shadow's gonna run the company? No, dude, he's just gonna give the operations back to fucking Gamma and Alpha. They're gonna handle it, and John Smith is gonna walk away into the sunlight, thinking I was so cool there. Like, there's no shot he's gonna do all the fucking management as CEO. And all this goes beyond pure entertainment value, and actually helps to strengthen the structure of the plot. Epsilon's status as an acclaimed in-demand concert pianist puts her in a perfect pianist. That's right. She's a she's a pianist. A professional player, the piano, not the penis. Perfect position to spy on the world's upper crust. Beta's career as an author provides cover Jesus. for her to research topics that might otherwise get the cult's attention and to write her epic Shadow Sama fan. That was so funny. Cause this is the moment where like Shadow appears to Zenon Griffith to save Alexi in episode five. But then there's another moment where Beta is like doing head like 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 uh, fan fiction and Zenon Zenon Griffith starts saying some really sus shit. I was like, who is this handsome man clad in the darkest of dark? Oh my god, look at his fucking you know, look at the look at his collarbone. Like he's, he starts like start. It almost sounds like fucking Yaoi like BL shit. Fic on the side where she replaces every other waifu in the show with herself. herself Gamma's yep. business acumen generates funding and political capital for the organization to take advantage of. And Ata invents the gadgets. Th that one's pretty. She just does science stuff. Don't don't worry about it. She just does science stuff. And Kai and Omega are always helping out on the side. Self-explanatory. The girls of Shadow Garden are all rich, varied, and flawed characters who each contribute. Flawed character. Gamma definitely has a flaw. Does everyone have their own flaw? I never really thought of it like that. Huh. Teach me. To the functioning of the organization and the progression of the plot. In I thought everyone just has their own specialties, but I never considered that a flaw. Like Gamma not being, you know, Gamma has the business acumen, but she's obviously not the best fighter. Her hand-eye coordination is trash. That's definitely a flaw, but I never considered everyone to have their own distinctive flaw. What's Epsilon's flaw? For not just being, just not having titties or ass? Like, that's the flaw of her? Maybe? In distinctive and meaningful ways. And the same can be said for basically every other recurring character in the show. Most of whom... I love shit like this in anime. Look at that. Look at Oriana's eyes one more time. Look at this shit. Look at this shit. Ooh, whenever anime does stuff like this, they trace the eyes with some kind of like bright, li like, like, um, these kind of lines with colors. It's always so cool. Character in the show, most of whom are also kick ass women. I'm not about to pretend this anime. Beta is possessive. You're right. You're right. But like, I, I never really consider these flaws. Huh. Anime is some empowering work of feminist art. And Delta is just dumb. Delta is just dumb. That's her plot. No, she's just a beast girl. Come on. The girls of Shadow Garden also all wear skin tight magic slime. That's right. Spandex clad. No, these, it's important, okay? The design is important. Highly conductive material for magic. Shadow's done plenty of, you know, hunting down Rimuru's uh, descendants, right? Gathered them all up. The slime core did a bunch of experimentation, handed it off to Ada. Ada then designed these spandex clad suits, right? You think it's fan service, but no, 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 no. There's a very important, you know, role to play here. Suits that can make huge fake mm, boobs if nice. they want them and, and frequently ass. melt off. Yeah, th this is fan service. Come on, like, 
the this this arc when the the barrier went up because of the artifact that cancels magic and then all their slime suits start disappearing like perfect fan service right even now like fucking john smith the string just like tying up oriana bro everyone's bust size go up like three cubs their bodies due to various magic shenanigans and the semi-feral wolf girl in particular has a habit of semi-feral i think she's full on feral turning most of her clothes into huge weapons bayonetta style so I thought Delta just doesn't like wearing clothes because she's a dog. So sometimes she just has like a line across her nipples, right? Like she doesn't always have all the slime suit on. Sometimes it's just a line across her nipples. And I thought to myself, this is just Delta, like, what's the word? She likes to be free. You know, it's, it's too limiting. But Mother's Basement is now telling me, the rest of the slime suit that goes away when she wears like that goes into the weapon. Particular has a habit of turning most of her clothes and turning most of her clothes into a huge weapon. So this this is the result of Delta wearing less of the slime suit. I never knew you could do that. That's crazy. What the fuck? Weapons bayonetta style. Really? Leaving is this real? Is he making this shit up or is this real? Only a teeny tiny bikini to frame her rippling lady abs. None of which- Like I never considered that- I, I just thought it's just fan service. Like, okay, Delta's dog girl, you know, Beast Girl's gonna do their thing. She's gonna wear the most limited amount of clothing. But the sword, the big bonk sword, that only happens because she has limited amount of slime suit on. That's- I never- Expect that. I'm complaining about to be clear, but I, I can see why someone else might. Also, the series starts off with like four different damsel kidnappings in the space of three episodes. Yeah, these these lines, yeah. Plus, plus another seven implied off screen, and that definitely is a lot much. That's right. Oriana was also saved by Stylish Banda Slayer. And the crazy shit is it looks like fucking everybody was saved by Stylish Banda Slayer. Because in the most recent episode of Eminence and Shadow, what the fuck happened? Yukime's past. Who saved Yukime? Not her mom, but who saved Yukime against Getan? It was fucking Childish Bandislayer. Sorry, Stylish Bandislayer. He's everywhere. This dude is just... He, Stylish Bandislayer gets retconned into everybody, dude. But if you dismiss this anime out of hand on those grounds, you would be throwing out a lot of strong, self-motivated babes, all of whom have significant mm. plot agency and... A he keeps zooming in on the ass when you say plot agency, but I agree. All these different girls do have their own motivations. I think even someone like Iris, like that a lot of people hate, I think she's a very pitiful character because her dad is fucking, she just is a shitty king. And the kingdom is left to Iris to fucking carry. And Iris is like struggling. Like it's definitely a character that is not like um one dimensional. I don't think so. I think Iris is a great character. Fuck Iris. Some people really hate her because people think that she's a cocky girl that fought the shadow and, and antagonizes them. But if you really think about the character, like there's not really a reason to hate her. In fact, you start pitying for her because of the situation she's in. Alexia, another character who's like overshadowed by her big sister. Her big sister who's going through all these insecurities too that Alexia has no idea about, right? And like Oriana too. Like she's in some deep shit with the fucking Rose Kingdom being taken over by Lord Perv Asshat. And she had to throw away everything to join Shadow Garden now. And like, if you really think about it, these are really well-written characters. A few of whom are serious rivals to the protagonist. Need more Beatrix, bro. We need more Beatrix, though. Along with all that etchy bathwater. Oh, oh, oh. God, I want... That's Sherry Barnett's chocolate scene. That was some sussy shit, but one more time, one more time, watch. Self-motivated babes. One more time. All of whom have significant... A lot of Oriana ass, but watch this. ...plot agency, and a few of whom are serious rivals to the Wait protagonist. For it. Along with all that etchy bath. Epsilon toes. One, two, three, four, five. Good. One, two, three, four, five. Just wanted to make sure that they were all in place. Just make this joint here. God, I want to drink it so bad. Fuck Iris. Why was she so mad at Shadow when Shadow saved her beloved sister? Bro, Iris doesn't know that. Iris doesn't know that Shadow saved her sister or anything. It's just like, no, like, Iris doesn't know this shit. All Iris knows is that there's this Monday man or Shadow in front of me that's in my way of, you know, beating, becoming like the fucking... Uh, second time winner of the Bushin Festival to prove to the kingdom. Like, you're giving her too much credit. Like, no, she has no personal grudge against Shadow. Like, she, she only hates him because she's in the way of her goals. Like, if you really think about her character, she's not someone you hate. She's someone you feel sorry for. She, you pity her. What was I talking about again? Shari Barnett's chocolate lip service. That's what you're talking about. Right. The characters. Burgers. Which are almost universally fantastic. Anyone with any sort of speaking role in this show is Bro. clearly full. That moment here, when Sherry Barnett versus Sid, like, sorry, the departure 
that's when she did that i i was like no shot she has like a new goal now this is gonna be a like end game opponent like the, i don't know what they're gonna do with her i i heard from the light novel readers that she's still yet to be reintroduced to the story right so i don't know what they're gonna do with sherry barnett a classic eminence and shadow thing to do is to set this up and just not follow through just just meme i think it'd be a waste of a character like that but just to fucking meme bro just fucking meme and be like yeah we set that up but forget about it it's like it's just for a joke following their own independent path through its world and whenever those paths happen to intersect with the main plot they always have a clear character motivated impact mm. on it as i watched the series i was pleasantly surprised time and again to see characters i'd all but forgotten pop their heads back up in unexpected places or reveal new layers <laughs> this is kind of important wait no i hear this is also important because this is the guy that we took on in episode two right and this is a pendant or the little thing that he had and shadow looks at and he's like whatever but this is the girl that was experimented on you know when um clara was taken hostage right no sorry alexia was in episode five uh alpha comes out fucking uses her i'm atomic you know save this girl somehow cleanses her of the monsterization and i thought she's done that i thought she got put to bed like rest in peace but people are saying now this might be kind of spoilers but like this might not be the last time you see her their previous actions and fans of the source material can tell you that every character from every episode mm. will be fair game for callbacks and comebacks as we I'm, wa I'm waiting for the Sherry Barnett, bro. I'm waiting for the Sherry Barnett to come back. But even Alexia has been making her moves back into the story just a bit. Last episode, too, we saw Alexia and Sid train together. Alexia apparently made Sid do it. But it's like, what are they cooking up with her? Like, she's too weak right now, but she wants power. There's no way she can just close the fucking power gap between her and the Shades through just mere training. No, she needs to just join Shadow Garden and get powers gifted, right? We move into season two. Of course, not every recurring character is gonna- No, Quentin made a callback. Quentin and Goldie. Now, this video was made seven months ago, so I'm sure Mother's Basement doesn't realize, but I'm sure he- Because uh, obviously season two didn't air then. Quentin and Goldie came back, Lawless City. They're pretty much just like a resemblance, a funny mirror of Skell and Poe, in my opinion. Time skip versions. Gonna play a significant role in the plot. Sid picked his best friends, Poe Tato and Skell Etel. Skeleton. Unless his name is Skeletal? Am I wrong? People told me that's Skeleton, but if it's Skeletal, then my bad. Specifically for their uncanny ability to never be doing anything remotely useful or plot. You're right. What have they done? What have these characters truly done? Think about it. Has Skell or Poe really... Did, did they have they... Did they do anything to help? No. They're just fucking mean characters. They're just on the side. Just... Just living fucking life. And I love them for it. Like, I don't hate them. But, like, have they done anything? Fucking no. <laughs> they haven't done shit, bro. Relevant. And there are plenty of other dudes with dumb puns for names who are just there to help fill out a crap. Yes, this is amazing. This episode of summoning rituals and everybody, every contestant's names were just dumb. It was so funny. Outer move a scene. They gave him the paper money. Did they? Did they really? Along. But you need crowd filler like that to make... Hey yo, he keeps calling. Okay, look at Quentin right here. Look at look at this. <laughs> this Poe is Quentin, dude. Or like that to make a world feel lived in, and the sheer level. Goldie, of here it is. This is Skeleton's brother, bro. Dumbness. The show is willing to shoot for with the. This dude has a fucking carriage thing. He has a little trolley to hold this fucking sword, dude. I love it. I love Goldie. These characters are so funny to me. These one-off gag characters, like the baseball knight yeah. in catcher armor who holds his sword like a bat. And I'm pretty sure his name was like fourth batter or some shit, you know? Because like in baseball, like the fourth batter is like the most important one. Because like obviously if there's three people on base, the fourth batter is going to hit his home run, then everyone's going to score. But anyways, like this, they're, they're all referenced. They're all just memes, right? They're just meme names. Makes even them a lot more memorable than your average anime. I forgot about this dude. Y'all remember this dude? In part of the Sherry Barnett arc? Look, 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 look. look. sword like a bat. Makes even them a Do you remember this dude? Do you remember this guy? Because he got defeated by Shadow when Shadow like was... Doing like a Spider-Man thing of looking from upside down, right? He, he did like a cool upside down thing. He, this guy's supposed to be like super fast or some shit. 
I totally forgot about him. Holy shit. One of the most forgettable fucking opponents. I don't think the author wasn't like wanted to make him memorable. Like he's not an like, important dude. He's just some random enemy background character A, right? But like, god damn, I completely forgot about this dude. A lot more memorable than your average These knights actually died. This is Iris's personal knights, right? There's two of them. And I think Nui was like a fiance to one of them too. Anime background goon. And in particular, the lengths to which Skell goes to be completely worthless in the final arc of season one make for some of its He's just gambling, right? Because because Goldie gave Skell a bunch of lessons of like, oh, the power level is this and this and this. So Skell kept making bets, but he kept losing. He's take and he took more loans from the government or whatever money shark, right? And then he started losing more and more and more until the point where he got fucking dragged out to serve a summer on the ship, right? That's why he got a tan, right? Yes, I remember that. I remember that shit. It's funniest moments. But even discounting all of those throwaway characters, Eminence's cast is impressively vast. Very I want Aneros to come back, please. Please, Aneros, please come back. ...and complex, which is vital in a story about competing conspiracies with hidden mm. agendas. If Eminence's plot didn't have such a staggering number of moving parts, its whole vibe would fall apart. And the many twists revealed about those... Was this really a twist? I think this is pretty intuitive of who the fucking... the, the, uh, the enemy was here, right? Because I called this a while... I think it was very obvious, right? I mean, it, it was a nice twist, though, still. Conspiracies and the history of the world, most of which will sound fairly familiar if you've seen Ain't enough. nobody thought that Baldi here was a good guy from the beginning. You know why? Because he's bald and it's a fucking war crime to be bald. Anime or played enough JRPGs would be exponentially less impactful and Lord Purvis hat. between its wealth of characters and all its rich veins of lore. The Aww. eminence in shadow is just so good at creating that feeling that there's way too much going on to keep mm. track of it all it does feel like that to me sometimes i'm very overwhelmed by the amount of things going on the exposition the stuff like that a lot of shit just goes over my head and i have to watch like more videos and like any news videos or other people that's like light novel cut content or summary reviews they really help me understand truly what's going on in the world but a lot of stuff because like there's so much fan service that happens right whenever they're doing exposition or explaining shit in eminence and shadow what i've noticed is that they fucking love to just what's the word just do a shitload of fan service the entire time so it gets me distracted but it also keeps the audience engaged in otherwise known as like a, a it would be like a boring scene to do a lot of lore drop exposition drop but if you do fan service with it then suddenly it's kind of more engaging which makes all the competing masterminds feel all the mastermindier. But because our main perspective character is more or less completely caught up in his own bullshit throughout all of that, we're not forced to feel overwhelmed by any of it. Eh, kind of like how Doom Guy's obsessive focus on Never demon this murder game. allowed id Software to cram an obscene amount of world building detail into Doom 2016 for those who want to look for it without Never it played ever it. threatening to bog down the plot. It's a clever demonstration of how the right narrative framing or tone can allow Ooh. a writer to effectively have their cake and eat it too. And one of many reasons I think any aspiring authors watching this anime should take copious notes. That's not to say the script and characters are completely airtight though. Is there a position for this when he's upside down like this and the girl's sitting on top like this? I think this is called the Amazon. At first it's a little hard to buy that Sid could really be completely unaware that both Shadow garden and the cult of diablos are real so like that's the thing that's 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 the one thing that i'm just overlooking is like how are you at this point still not aware that shadow like the cult of diablos is not real like after all we've been through how are you still convinced that none of this shit is real and like it's not that deep we don't have to care about it like anderson shadow is not an anime you need to nitpick about details like that but if the whole premise is that to Sid, everybody's just role-playing they're just girls that have a shadow garden girls are just role-playing they're just playing around you know just and the but the enemies the end what about the fucking enemies bro i guess they're so weak compared to him, he doesn't even consider them i don't, sometimes i'm just like how the fuck are you still at this point not taking this shit seriously considering just how many girls he rescues from them before the story even begins but don't you worry as it goes on it only gets exponentially harder to believe like this guy solved multiple oh. kidnappings that led to secret underground cult labs. That's the sister, right? That's the daughter of that guy from the episode two that we took up in the pendant. Cult labs defeated a terrorist attack on his own school, blown up two cities, Straight become up. an accessory to regicide, and murdered multiple.
multiple guys who directly referenced the cult before bulking up with demon pills. Straight, that this did happen, right? These pills, he's like, I'm the third awakener or something. That's what Zenon Griffey said. And he still thinks all of it's just an elaborate LARP his childhood. And like, I guess the only way this is believable is that either he's so tuny and to the point where he's delusional or he's so fucking powerful that he's witnessing all this shit, but it's so child play to him. So I guess that power gap makes him all the more, uh, what's the word? Not gullible, but naive to the world around him. Like, maybe that makes sense. Good friends set up around some random crimes that were happening. I mean, yeah, it does all line up with a bunch of nonsense. He ad-libbed off the top of his head based on random items around the room. So it makes sense that he'd find it hard to believe it's true. But all of those items were from the same Cult of Diablos mm -hmm. caravan that was trafficking Alpha. So he didn't actually pull all of that out of his ass. He filtered real clues through his memory. Mental framework. True, he didn't just make up Cult of Diablos. He saw the fucking bottle in the back, and that was from, you know, the truck that was, you know, that was part of the Cult of Diablos people, right? So it kind of makes sense. Work ...of Chunibyo cliches to reach a conclusion. And given how Sid consistently sees proof that... Like, like, what did you think was actually going on here, Sid? You transport into a different dimension, you're talking to Aurora, someone that you summoned, you, you see this, like, sword. Like, what do you really think is happening here, bro? Is this just, just a gameplay to you? This world tends to adhere to such cliches. He really should be able to figure it out with just a bit of thought. As a counterpoint to that line of logic, though, it's funnier if he doesn't, so he doesn't. Shekumato da once again, atheist. Honestly, true. Like, I don't really think that that deep of it. It's just like, whatever. This is the whole premise is that, you know, all this is the, just a lie and he's just going along with it and none of it's really real to him. And to everyone else, this is real to him. And it's, it's that simple. You don't have to really think that deep. That's just, that's just what it is. It's not the kind of anime where you need to really like fucking analyze like why is Sid not realizing what's going on around him. He is touchy. Now, some of you might accuse me of making excuses for a weakness in the show's writing there, but is it a weakness in the show's writing that Sid doesn't, that after everything that's happened, that Sid is still unaware? I don't think so, because this anime is not supposed to be taken seriously. The entire premise was already so ridiculous. I, I think a lot of people overlook it. I think a lot of people don't even understand. Here's the thing. I think a lot of people, truly, a lot of Eminence and Shadow Watchers don't even understand the premise that he is just LARPing and he thinks that everyone else is LARPing with him. Like, straight up. People don't know that. They just see the hype bite scenes and they're just watching it for that. And everything else just like goes over their heads. Like straight up, I'm, I'm not even lying. But I'd argue that Eminence's awareness of what exactly its nature as a trashy comedy lets the serious bits get away with. Yeah, I think that's one of the strongest parts about hiding behind the facade that this is just a trashy isekai. Because when you do that, suddenly you can get away with a lot of shit. For example, direct comparison is like me when I'm doing anime reactions. I often call myself dumb, I'm too stupid, you know, I'm not smart enough to do this. Because if I fucking say that I'm smart, you guys are going to give me a much harder time and much uh, criticism. But if I, if I come in with the premise that I'm a dumb monkey reactor, then suddenly, even if I guess 100 things and get 99 things wrong, if I land that one thing, then suddenly you guys are like, oh my god, he's so fucking smart. He's such a genius. You hide behind this facade. Never show your true power level, guys. Never. Actually one of its greatest strengths. Because that choice doesn't just have entertainment value within the narrative. By making Sid be kind of a dumb guy about this one specific thing and go along with other things mm. just for the fun of it, the show absolves him of any obligation to solve all its problems with true. all his powers, allowing other characters to actually do, do it for him. With yeah, let's Shadow Garden everyone else do it around him and Shadow just shows up and does his cool shit. It's as simple as that. And no one really has to blame Sid. He's just really ignorant and dumb in that one department of understanding that this may not be just LARPing. Without having to fall back on the stale waiting for Goku formula. Additionally, because Sid is LARPing as a cryptic dickhead anti-hero purely for the fun of it, he has no motivation to clear up any tragic misunderstandings that <laughs> might need to <laughs> The Sherry part has seen here, bro. <laughs> like, we could have straight up told him, hey, Sherry, Sherry, okay, hear me out. I did kill your adoptive father here. It literally looks like that, I know, but... It was for your own good because he actually murdered your mom back in the past. So, in fact, I'm the good guy here, Sherry, okay? You don't need to do this, like, villain arc and get back at me in the future. 
but he didn't do that. And some people actually said, and I'm not sure if this is headcanon, I'm not sure if this is what the author actually wanted to do with shit, but the whole point of neglecting this is to make sure that Sherry doesn't blame her own father. She's already had it so bad. If she were to know the truth, it would be even sadder, right? If you understand that logic. I hear some people mention that in the comment section. I'm not sure if that's real or not, though. To advance the story. In fact, in the climactic two-on-one battle with Iris and Beatrix, he's actively incentivized to confuse matters further just so he can enjoy a good fight and finally try out the evil laugh he's been practicing. Right, because the whole point of this, the final episode, or like Monday Men, like approaching the finals, is like, how should I wrap up the season, right? He's like ideating. He's like, hmm, should I be like a good guy saving everybody? Should I be like a villain? Wouldn't it be funny to be a villain, right? And he goes the villain route. The same. Which means he doesn't have to waste any time saying, wait, you don't understand. Perv asshat brainwashed the king. And yeah, in the standard anime, you would try to clear your name and try to explain all this shit, but nah. Shadow's a Giga Chat. You don't give a fuck about that. He will never mention that to you. No, uh-uh, unexplained. Just gonna show up, fucking troll you, and leave. As a bonus, Iris doesn't end up being unintentionally characterized as a stupid, stubborn jackass for not listening just so a fight can happen. His absurd characterization ends up shielding the integrity of all the other characters from hmm. necessary plot contrivances that might otherwise damage them and he mother spaceman has a good point here Sid's kind of flaw or shit like that of like not you know adhering to these standard anime formulas of explaining shit suddenly makes absolves everyone else of their own problems too he's able to get away with it every single time because huh. from the audience's perspective Sid's distinct mix of total genre awareness and total situational ignorance is endlessly fun. We don't ever want him to stop being the kind of guy who'd actively try to avoid all the protagonisty waifus after his canonically never sent for a girl once in his life, never massive c just to keep up his NPC persona, or the kind of guy who'd waste precious hours in the middle of a political crisis dragging a grand piano down to the most aesthetic spot. Again, like, how the fuck was this piano moved to the bottom of the fucking, like, sewers, bro? And where the fuck is this feathers coming from? How is there air current in the sewers right now? Does he have a fan behind to lift his fucking feathers in the cape? Surely he has a fan behind, right? In the sewers, just so the heroine can stumble upon him. And you know that, like, he was waiting for Orion to show up. Just, like, he was, like, hearing for the footsteps. Because he started playing the Moonlight Sonata as soon as she showed up, right? Because he was waiting. So he's not playing the entire time. He was waiting, waiting. Then he heard the footsteps. He's like, all right, now is my time. Let's go. Dramatically playing Moonlight Sonata. Because that whole bit is just so darn fun. But what's especially neat about Sid's propensity for LARPing, from a writer's perspective at least, is how, in addition to being exceptionally funny, it allows him to fill whatever role the story needs of him. And yes. in so doing- And his different personas, right? Monday Man filled a role that Sid couldn't do or Shadow couldn't do. Monday Man specifically could pop off because the whole premise of Mon Monday Man was finally no more background character. Let's fucking go in and let's beat people doing the most mundane shit possible so they look even worse, right? John Smith, another example, different character. Now he can go and defeat Shadow Garden by himself, his own group, but the girls don't know that. And by doing so, it'll make everyone feel like, wow, the Shadow Garden was defeated. The only man that could actually start in Shadow Garden. All these different personas really does let him fill whatever role the story wants him to do. It makes him a very multi-dimensional character. ...show us different sides of himself that keep his mostly static character from getting too stale. Across three different tournament slash battle festival arcs in this first season, he's able to tick three very different tropes off his seemingly endless bucket list. Firstly, he plays the nameless Mapu. chopper who... The Mafu, and I was very disappointed in this, in this tournament, even though this is still the most viewed TikTok, right? Right now, my, one of, uh, my, my most viewed video on TikTok right now is this fucking duel. A uh, Sid doing Mafu against Oriana. Fucking 2 million views, I have no fucking clue why. I, thought, I didn't think it was that good, but I just, I just wanted him to pop off, right? But Monday Man did that for us. Sid couldn't. Loses in the first round in spectacular fashion to make the heroine look cooler. But in doing so... Oriana actually fell in love with Sid here because of Sid's, like, resolve, his willpower to keep getting up, right? Maybe a little too spectacular in retrospect. 
He straight up rizzed her with mob food. Like, how the fuck do you make this girl fall in love with you after looking like this in front of her? Like, think about it. Isn't that insane? He made Oriana made, like, fall in love after he posed to her like this. That's fucking crazy to me. Considering the impression he leaves on Rose by using all 48 of his ultimate mob forms in one match, yeah, ultimately he has 48. leading to him being signed up for another unwanted attention-grabbing slot in the next magic fighting tournament type thing. But with some quick thinking, he was able to turn that situation around too by turning into Shadow and playing the classic tournament Villain. crashing interloper. But oh, of wait, course, wait, that's a different the arc. final and biggest tournament arc where... Sid chooses to don a third persona so he can do the whole dark horse who beats everyone unexpectedly bit. What the fuck? Hold up, hold up. Beats everyone. Wow. You can see the shadow of a nipple here. One. Right? It's not really a nipple, but you can see a shadow of a nipple here. The eminence and shadow. Unex the eminence and mip nipple. Expected the nipple and shadow bit without compromising his secret identity is far and away the most fun the show has yes. with his character yes. watching him juggle all three roles like archie on a date so he can help rose win the turn <laughs> he was just like you know he had to be in sit form to talk to rose or oriana or like you know claire because claire wanted him to watch the fight but then he had to go to monday man and later on he was also shadowed too a lot of different hats he's wearing at the same time maintain his cover and not piss off his yandere onachan we that mission failed she's always pissed off at us because we again every time she fights we're never there is a laugh riot in and of itself and the glee he takes in extracting carefully manufactured reactions from the audience in his performance as mundane man makes for an excellent parody of the whole tournament arc trope i especially enjoyed watching him ponder how he'd end it all contemplating different cliched routes his character could go down in the final battle only yes and that's where he he was thinking about should i go to villain route how should i end this fight you know do i go to hero route do i go to villain route should i do my epically research like rehearsed laugh to have rose make the choice for him and take the story in a more interesting direction. By having Sid constantly try to shoot for and construct the most dramatic scenarios possible in any given situation without ever putting himself directly at the center of that drama, the story is able to keep the goals of its funny and serious elements aligned, and I think both sides are much stronger for it. The humor yeah. also allows that massive... Yes. Com the humor is a big point of Eminence and Shadow. I think the humor is one of the most core components of Eminence and Shadow. Right now, Anero is realizing how Monday Man was fighting, cracking the neck and sneezing, because these are very important battle mechanics, and she's like actually practicing it too. It's so cute, but it's so funny at the same time. Complex cast I was talking about to function a lot more efficiently than it otherwise might in a more consistently yeah. serious anime. <laughs> He shows all these funny moments and he shows Iris just fucking crashing down to her knees and crying. In just the second episode, before the plot proper has even had a chance to start, Sid has an entire family plus seven mm -hmm. named subordinates and has to face a minor villain with his own motivations, all of whom need to be juggled by the script in a tight 20 minutes while it's- Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I had no idea what the fuck was going on in episode two, bro. Like, straight up. I was like, what the fuck are we doing? Okay, we got a bunch of these girls, like, what the fuck? But the episode was fire. That episode, like- episode two that was it was good i didn't know what the fuck was really going on i just saw shadow just doing cool shit i was like okay busy laying groundwork for the show's whole premise and building up its setting by painting them all with broad comedic strokes and stereotypes though the show is able to leave a memorable impression of each one that it can come back to fill in later even though she doesn't get much screen time after episode two for but I hear that someone even made like a video on like why Claire is like one of the most important videos. Like I think we're going to watch it. Like an Eminence and Shadow video about how Claire is like the true protagonist of Eminence and Shadow or some shit. I don't really know. But now that she has Aurora with her, right? Because she has the progenitor of vampires with the possessed blood all coming into together. I don't know. Somehow Aurora is basically in... Uh, Claire now, right? I hope that Claire gets more screen time. For instance, the characterization of Sid's sister Claire as, at first, a serious young swordsman with a bit of a brother complex, and later, when they're grown up, essentially a yandere, implies an entire off-screen arc. Clearly, Sid's continuous efforts to distance himself from all her protagonist-y goings-on 
Yeah, I never understood why, like, Sid was, like, running away from Claire. Never really understood, like, because she was too overbearing. Gone, ...have left her feeling hurt and neglected by the brother she loves so much. And his carefully calculated NPC slackery has made her increasingly worried for his future. And <laughs> she even tried to get him, like, a government job. That's the entire point of going to Lawless City, right? Which there was some kind of, like, uh, government night post there, and she was trying to get him a job. Claire really is a good sister, if you think about it. And all that has gradually twisted her innocent joy and pride at being an older sister into something much darker. Which is, oh. of course, very funny. A smile is a smile, but I do not see a smile here. This is just intimidation. ...on its face, but also creates an impression of persistent character depth that will make it feel natural if and when Claire does step out of the background and into a more substantial role in the story. You That's right, season two. Again, seven months ago, Mother Basement didn't know it, but he's pretty much right. Season two, she is stepping up. Hopefully, she actually steps up more, though. You can see the show employ a similar trick with Rose Oriana, who's introduced in the first arc is just your typical over-serious student council president type in conflict. True. Never really thought she was important. I just saw her design. She's like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. But then after, she gets all lovey-dovey and is like, oh, I see, I see. Like with Claire after Sid's arrest, funnily enough. Then, in the second arc, even as Sherry is busy taking the lead, the show adds many layers to her character in just a few scenes. Her earnestness becomes the butt of the joke when she <laughs> indulges one more time. He did that intentionally. One more time. What do you say? Just a few scenes. Her earnestness. You got a lot of gat right here, a lot of butt, and. Becomes the butt of the joke. Ha 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 ha. When she indulges our non hero in trying out all of his background character pratfall moves. 48 of them. Back. 48 then that joke gets even funnier when, in her naive innocence, she's convinced that he fought so hard. Yeah, he fought so hard, and right now his goal is to be the first one to die when a terrorist organization attacks the school because that is a chuny dream. But you know what he's thinking? No, 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 no. You know what she's thinking? She's like, oh my god, this boy who fought me, you know, in the tournament with such resolve, such willpower, even though he's not strong, and even now he's like training, and he's sorry, he's jumping in front to save me. Like, complete misunderstanding, but still, it's great. Hard and ultimately took a terrorist sword for her because he has a crush on her. Rizzed her up, bro. Fucking rizzed her up so easy. When the stakes of the story are raised, though, the love she believes he had for her believably motivates her to lead the story. Actually, in the arc here, right? Because what happens? What happens? Uh, Shadow shows up, and then she says to Rose, my beautiful swords, uh, swordsman, right? I think something like that. My beautiful sword master or something? ...students counterattack on the invaders and help save the day. And when we move into the next arc, single-minded and one-sided drive to unstarcross the love between herself and the unwilling background character <laughs> creates a situation where Shadow has to make an appearance to cover his alter ego's ass, moving the whole story forward. Most of that's played for laughs, and she's very much a supporting character in the Holy Ground infiltration arc. Yeah. Yeah. Which is all about the Shadow Garden girls and Aurora the Witch. She might be a background character like here, but I, but again, I think that her joining Shadow Garden and stuff like that is one of my favorite things about uh, like season one with her development. I, I hope that she wouldn't get tossed around just like a random background character and it's just like done. Kind of like Alexia, even though Alexia is coming back sooner or later in the story from what I've been hearing. But because of those moments, when Rose finally does step into the secondary protagonist spotlight yeah. during the Bushin so Festival, good. it feels fully earned, and her goofy desperation to make Sid a viable marriage candidate ends up being cast in a new, more serious light by the revelation that she'd otherwise be doomed to marry a dude named Perv Asshat. Lord Pervassad, who serves another dude who has Dio's voice actor. Man, even when I'm trying to talk up the intricacies of its characters, there's just no getting around how trashy the Eminence in Shadow really is. But then, that's it's the whole not purpose. like it makes even the slightest effort to hide it, and in fact, that's exactly what makes it such a strong story. Tra Trashy Isekai, again, hide behind the facade of a trashy Isekai, and it kind of is, but completely double down on the cringe factor on it, and then suddenly you have a beautiful piece of art. Trash is ultimately just another mode of anime storytelling, and like any mode of storytelling, it carries expectations with it.
I'd rather it be intentional trash, but end up being good rather than something that tries to do the standard formula and then just be just the cringing trash itself, right? Then that's not fun. But when you're self-aware and you double down, then it's fun. That a skilled storyteller can use and subvert to delight and surprise their audience at every turn, which is exactly what this series does. It's easy to write the eminence in shadow off as nothing Oh, no, 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 I've lost titties! Likeable yet fundamentally worthless garbage, but that's exactly what he wants you to think, so you don't catch on to his powerful secrets. He, of course, being Daisuke Aizawa, whose original books you can get on Bookwalker, just saying. And I'd seriously recommend them, or this anime, to anyone who wants to better Agreed. understand and wield the powers of character writing and story structure. Or anyone who's ever waited their whole life to say, ha 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 ha, that was just an after image, you fool. I'm Jeff Thu, professional cringe lord and i oh. categorically he actually has i don't know i, I thought it's just mother's basement but he actually has a name jeff tool pretty cool this is our first mother's basement video we watched together please go sub to this channel if you enjoyed it like the video if you did fantastic video from him pretty fucking long and i salute you if you're still here after what is this like a fucking hour long reaction but again and shadow a beautiful piece of art that hides behind this facade of what a trashy anime might be, but still amazing regardless. By the way, we do these reactions live on stream on YouTube, 7 a.m. PSD. So hope to see you sometime. Bye.